We are able to walk and talk and listen. All the faculties are working. And we are coming to the church. There are so many people who slept in the night and couldn't get up. There are many people who are bedridden. But you have been kind to us, Lord, loving and caring. And you have brought us into this church to honor you, to sing praises for you, to you, to worship you, to glorify you. And now, Lord, it is your turn to give us your word. Man shall not live by food alone, but by every word that proceeds out of God's mouth. We want that fresh bread of life, Lord. Give us the fresh <laughs> bread of life to each one of us, Lord. You know the needs of each and every one of us here, Lord. And Holy Spirit, use my mouth to proclaim your words and not my words. In the name of Jesus, I pray. And thank you, Lord, for everything. Amen. Thanks, thanks be to God that Pastor Bob and his family have come back safe. Yes. The Lord has been merciful. And let us not forget Kyle and his family. Let us keep him in our prayers. They are far away from us. And they'll be for some time there, for some months. But it's nice. But for me, it is a bit shaky. Because I've been always sitting there and Pastor Bob has been here. <laughs> and now I'm here and Pastor Bob is there. So. It's not easy, <laughs> but the Lord is with me and the Holy Spirit is with me and he will give me the strength. Amen. Amen. To God be the glory. So today I'm, the, the Lord has put one particular verse, a scripture portion, which is, we all know the, that verse and that is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the only place where it is mentioned spirit, soul and body. Three all three are mentioned. This is the only one place. So what is the spirit, soul, and body? God is Trinity, three persons in one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we human beings have been created in God's image. And we are three parts in one, spirit, soul, and body. Spirit is the most important part of our being. So soul. In, in the Old Testament, people didn't know soul and spirit. All the worship in the Old Testament times was in the soul, because there was no Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God came upon people, but the Holy Spirit was not inside people, because Jesus, he had not been crucified. He didn't die for the sins of the world as yet. So on the day of Pentecost, after the crucifixion and resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ, when the Holy Spirit was poured out, then the Holy Spirit came into the believers and our hearts were cleansed and the Spirit became very important. Unfortunately, most of our praising and, and singing and all this is done in the soul, body and soul. L let me explain what is body, soul and spirit. Body is our body, our hands, our feet, our eyes, and all this. When we were singing, we used our hands, lifting up our hands. We used our eyes to see the words. We used, we used our eyes to read the Bible. We used our hear, ears to hear the word of God. So this is the body. Then there is soul. Soul has got three. There are three faculties. One is mind. That is, our mind is educated. When we study the Bible, we get knowledge. And then there are emotions. The second part, emotion. This also consists of, of the soul. When we sing praises, we sometimes we get emotional, even tears also flow. When we're happy, we clap. When we're sad, we, we are sad, you can see it on our faces. 
And then the third part is the will. This is the deciding faculty. So this is what is the soul, mind, emotions, and will. So how does this function? When we don't know a word, what do we do? We refer to the dictionary and see what is the meaning of that. So when we don't understand something in the New Testament, we go to the spiritual dictionary. And the spiritual dictionary is our Lord Jesus Christ. His life on this earth for 33 and a half years, how he lived, that's how we have to see. That's how we get our, that's how we are supposed to live. So when Jesus came in John 1.14, it says, John 1.14, the word that is Jesus Christ became flesh. That means he became a human being like us and dwelt among us. But if you see the original Greek, it says he tabernacled among us. So here we get the word. If you see the, the Amplified Bible, there is mentioned tabernacled. And tabernacled is the right, verse, right word. So Jesus is the tabernacle. So what is the tabernacle? What is the function of the tabernacle? The tabernacle that God told Moses to build, it had three parts, the outer court, and then there was a tent in two parts. The first part of the tent was the holy place, and the second part of the tent was the most holy place. Brother, can you show me the picture here? You, you, you can see here, so this is the tabernacle. You see the outer court where people are there and then there's a, there's a bronze offering on which the animals were burnt and then there's a laver there after, by the side of it in which water was there and the priests, they washed their hands and all that. <coughs> so that is, that is the outer court and that corresponds to our body. You see the outer court is visible our body also, every part is visible. Then there's a tent there. That tent is divided into two parts. People always assembled in this outer court. Only the priests went into the temple, inside the tent, the first part of the tent. And that tent was the, called the holy place, where there was a menorah, the, the seven branch lamp, and then there was the Shubra table, the showbread table on which they put every week they put 12 loaves of bread and then there was the, the offering table on which they offer, they burn the incense, table of incense. So only the priests could go there. And then behind that there was a, there's a curtain dividing this, this, this tent and behind that was the most holy place. That's the place where the Ark of the Covenant was kept. And that's the place where God met with, with Moses and Aaron. So God was not in the outer court. He was not in the holy place, but he was in the most holy place. The holy place corresponds to our soul. And the most holy place corresponds to our spirit. And God's fire was seen there on top of that most holy place. And God came and spoke with Moses and Aaron there. No human being could enter that most holy place. Only the high priest, once a year, he went there on the day of Yom Kippur, that is the day of atonement. He went with the blood of bulls and rams. He was trembling. There were bells in his tassels and they tied a rope around his waist because if, if God was angry with him or with the nation, he will just fall dead. And, and how to go and bring him out? So when the bells were ringing, they knew that he's alive. And if he dropped dead, then you cannot hear the bells. So they will pull him out. That, it was so scary to enter that most holy place. But when Jesus died, when Jesus died on the cross, the moment he died, you see in Matthew's gospel that 
that, that thick veil that separated the holy place and the most holy place, it was torn in two from top to bottom. That means now we can enter the most holy place and have communion in our spirit with the Lord. Because the Lord wants to have communion with our spirit. He cannot have, he cannot have fellowship with us, with our soul or with our body. It is only in the spirit. When I came to know this, for years I didn't, for decades I didn't know it. But recently when I came to know this, it, re it, it opened my eyes. I said, Lord, all these days I didn't know it. And I, I can see that many people also don't know it. And I, I said, Lord, the people should know it. And the Lord has given me the opportunity today. So I, I want to share it with you. And whatever I say, that's not going to make any effect. But I pray that the Holy Spirit will touch each one of our hearts so that we will long to go into the most holy place. How to go into the most holy place? For that also we have to see the life of Jesus Christ. He is our dictionary. He is our role model. We, I think we are in John. Let's take a look at John chapter 4. We are in 1. Let's take a look at John chapter 4 and verse 23 and 24. This is what Jesus told the Samaritan woman. But an hour is coming, and now is, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. For such people, the Father seeks to be his worshippers. That means when the Father is searching for people who will worship in spirit and truth, that means there are very few people. There are not very many. You search for, like, if you want to, you don't go and search for stones. You just go out, there are many stones. But if you want gold, diamonds, you have to go to that particular shop, searching for that particular shop, because they're expensive and costly. In the same way, worshiping in the spirit is a very expensive thing. It's the best thing. That's the only way we can worship the Lord. So that's what God is wanting. And God is spirit, verse 24, God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. We lift our hands. We sing. We repeat over and over again. Everything, fine, that's very good. But still, we are not in the spirit. We are there in the soul. There's something blocking us. We are unable to go in the spirit. So how do we go in, in the spirit? How to enter that place? Let's look at Jesus. Hebrews chapter 6. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 6. One of the blessings, we are actually very blessed people. I don't know how much you have realized that we live in the new covenant times, the times of grace. And this is the, in the old covenant, it was so different. People could, they called Jehovah, God, they could never call him father. But when we come to the new covenant, Jesus, when he taught his disciples to pray, he said, pray, our Father. You know, when, when you say our Father, it's a very intimate relationship. If my son comes and tells me, Mr. Emmanuel Paul, or respected Emmanuel Paul, <laughs> I will laugh at him. I, 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 I'll be upset. I'll say, what's gone wrong with you? But he comes to me and says, Daddy. He, he, he'll be 30, 40, 50 years old also, but he, he will come and tell me, Daddy. And that, I feel so happy. So whenever we say these big words like Jehovah, Adonai, these kind of things, and the Lord is saying, no, I'm your father. In Hebrews 8.12, we are in 6, let's go to Hebrews 8.12. The, the beauty of the, the new covenant I want to show you. Hebrews 8 and verse 12. See, there are three things God is going to do. Remember this, the, the, the Old Testament was, thou shalt, thou shalt not. That means you will do this, you will not do this. There were 613 laws, including the Ten Commandments. And all of them were, you will do this, you will not do this. You will do this, you will not do this. That's all. It's all you, you, you. There was no help. But when you come to the New Covenant, 
Hebrews 8 is the place where the new covenant is mentioned very nicely. I like this place. It has opened my eyes. See what the Lord says. Verse 12, let's go from bottom to top. Verse 12, for I will be merciful to your sins, to your iniquities, and I will remember your sins no more. What a beautiful verse this is. It's very encouraging. He's saying, I will forgive all your sins when you come to me, and I won't even remember your sins. That means he will never have, he remembers our sins, but he will never point out and say, hey, you did this on such and such day. That's one, okay? And then, verse 11. No one shall teach everyone his fellow citizen and everyone his brother, saying, know the Lord. For all will know me from the least to the greatest of them. What's the meaning of this, all will know me? So in, in that case, we don't have to teach Bible and all that? No, no, that's not the thing. We will know him as our father, as our loving father, our heavenly father. Earthly fathers are limited, but they're loving. They take care of the children. And our heavenly father, who is almighty, how much more he will take care of us. There are many things we ask and he, some, he doesn't grant. You know why he doesn't grant it? And we'd say that he didn't answer my prayer. No, he has heard our prayers, but he knows that if he grants this, it, it can be disastrous for us. So he doesn't grant it. And I praise God for that. In my life, I've seen there are times when I asked some things and the Lord didn't grant. And I was very, very vexed, disappointed. But today I, I fall prostrate and I thank the Lord because if he would have granted, my life would have been very different today. So as we have fellowship with the Lord, slowly we will understand him more and more as a true father. In 1 John, it says little children and then young people and then father and mother, parents. These are the three stages in the church. Once upon a time, we are little people. Little people means you can see in our prayers, we keep asking for things. Lord, do me this, do me that. All, all on Monday, earthly things, physical. But then, when we come to that youth, then our prayers become very different. It is more of spiritual things. You see a small little boy, a four-year-old boy, what will he do? If his father is going on a trip, on a business trip, he will tell, Daddy, bring me this and bring me that. And the moment the father comes, he will tell, Dad, did you bring me? He'll say, yes, I brought her, and he's very happy. He jumps in the father's lap. And if the father says that, oh, I forgot, no, I didn't have time, he gets very angry. He won't jump in his lap. <laughs> so there are believers in that, in that uh, level who keep asking things, and when they don't get, they don't realize that for our own good, God has not given that. And they say, oh, the Lord has forgotten me. But our Lord is so patient that he tolerates all this. And he says, child, grow up. But the 25-year-old year, uh, 25 year old boy, when the father comes, he will tell, dad, how was the business? Did everything go well? He's not asking for things. So there is another stage. And then comes the parenting stage in which we become parents to, the, to others. This is what must go on in the church. OK, this was something else. So let us go to Hebrews chapter, uh, one more, and then here, this, we are in Hebrews 8, let me finish this, the last one, the third one is, I will put my laws in their mind, and I will write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Did you see the difference? In the, in the Old Testament it was, you will, you will not, you will, you will not. And here it's all, I will, I will, I will. I will put my laws in their minds. That means in the mind he will put, he, that means he will give us the desire to do his will. And I will write them on their hearts, means he will give us the ability to fulfill it. We may have the desire, but if we don't have the ability, we cannot do what he wants us to do. So he says, I will give you the desire and the ability. So this is the new covenant. And now let's go to Hebrews 6 and see what, how to enter the tabernacle into the most holy place. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 19 and 20. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, 
a hope both sure and steadfast. You know, what is this hope? In 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2, it says that one day when Jesus comes to receive us, when we see him, we will become just like him in nature and in character. That is our hope. One day, not only that Jesus is going to come and receive us, but that we are going to become like him in nature and character. And the next verse says that all of us who have this hope will purify ourselves. How is the purification done? This is the way it is done. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast, and what, one which enters within the veil. You see the thick veil which now has torn. We have to enter that veil. Only when we enter that veil, we can have fellowship with God. Verse 20, where Jesus has entered as a forerunner. This is the only place in the Bible where we, we see a title of Jesus Christ as forerunner. It's nowhere mentioned. So Jesus is our forerunner. We are to run in his footsteps and enter the most holy place. Now let's go to Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 20. No, 19. Let's go to 19. Okay, I'll, I'll take from verse 16, 16, 17, 18, and then come to 19. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws upon their heart and on their mind I will write them and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. We have seen that in Hebrews 8 also. Now where there is forgiveness of these things, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, because all this the Lord has done for us, he says, I will do all this. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, this word, by a new and living way, wonderful word. This, this is the only place in Hebrews we find this word, a new and living way. Jesus has opened a new and living way for us to enter into the most holy place in the presence of God, where God is there and Jesus Christ is there as an advocate. And we are in their midst. By a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil, through the veil. And what is that veil? That is his flesh. His flesh means his will. Jesus had a very strong will, just like us human beings. Because if he didn't have his a will of his own, then he could not teach us anything. If his will and God's will was the same, then we can tell him, Lord, we cannot do the things that you're telling us to do. That's why he had to become a, a, just like us, a man. And he was tested in every way. Any temptation that you and I get, he got. But he never sinned, he overcame. And how did he overcome? Not because he was the son of God, because the Holy Spirit was with him and he didn't want to sin. So how did he do that? Have the answer in Hebrews chapter five. I'm showing you quite some verses because I want to make it sure that what I'm telling is according to the Bible and it's not my imagination or not my own understanding. So in, verse, in Hebrews chapter five and verse seven, we see here, it talks about Jesus in the days of his flesh. That means when he was living on this earth for 33 and a half years, he offered up both prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears. With loud crying and tears. Why? For what? To the one, that means to God, able to save him from death. This death is not physical death because he had to go on the cross to, to save him from spiritual death. Because if he committed even a small little sin in his thought, he would not have been the Lamb of God the pure, clean Lamb of God to die for our sins. So, you know, for 33 and a half years, it was, he had a very difficult time. He was, he, he was crying, loudly he was crying, shedding tears. When did we shed tears? We shed tears when, supposing some, if our child is sick, or if my job is gone, we cry. But for sinning, Lord, I am unable to overcome these sins. 
How many of us have shed tears with loud cries? Loud cries means we cannot loudly shout, but in our hearts, in our hearts we can shout. In our very bed we can shout. My wife is sleeping by me, beside me in the night, and I in my, I am crying out to the Lord, Lord, I'm unable to overcome these temptations. I'm falling every now and then. Lord, help me unless you help me, unless you give me grace. I cannot overcome these sins. See, we can grit our teeth and we can say, okay, from today I will not do this, I will not do that, I will be like this. Oh, it will not happen. Just give up everything. In Genesis, we have the story of Abraham. Abraham, God told him, I will give you a son. But then as they were getting old, they started doubting. And then he listened to his wife. She told, okay, you take Hagar, my maid, and you can get a child. I am barren, but she's not barren. And they got a child, and God said, I don't want this child. This, this, is, this is not the one. You will get a child. And God had to wait for 100 years till Abraham became big, and Sarah was 19, 90 years old, just to show that he, you are useless for, to conceive. And then, supernaturally, came Isaac. What do we learn from there? We strive and strive and strive not to sin. God says, I don't want the striving from you. Just depend upon me. John 15, 5 says, without me you can do nothing. That's what Jesus said. We can do many things without Jesus. We got good, good brains and all. Those who are intelligent can do many things. And unfortunately, many of the Christian work is done with you know, knowledge and intelligence. It looks very good and it's very nice. And one day all that will burn like wood, hay, and straw. And only that which is from the Lord, according to his will, what we have done, that will come out like gold, silver, and precious stones. It's there in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. And also, there are many other things. When we do, some, when we do something, what is the motive? I'm preaching today here. It's a good thing, you know. But what is the motive? Am I seeking money? Or am I seeking honor? So that all will think that, oh, Emmanuel. No, I'm just like you. I want to make this very clear. Just because I'm standing behind the pulpit, I'm not something special. Actually, I will be judged much more because what I'm telling you, if it's not according to my life, and I'm not perfect, but I have made up my mind that I will, if I fall, I'll get up, but I will keep going. It says, press on towards perfection. And in Corinthians, Paul the Apostle says to the Corinthians, run in such a way that you will win the prize. Because the Olympic Games, only first, second, third prize is there. But the Christian race, looking at Jesus, no, fixing our eyes on Jesus. King James Version says, looking our eyes on Jesus. But NASB says, fixing our eyes on Jesus. I like the word fixing. You take two planks, put them together, and put a nut and bolt and tighten them. They will not shake. That's how our eyes should be on Jesus. Because our eyes, you know, they can just go here and there anywhere, the situations and, and pe what people are telling. And, but our eyes should be fixed on Jesus, and we should run the race, Hebrews 12. We will fall. doesn't matter. We will fall hundreds of times but we got to reach the finished line. You know, a little child, when, when the little child is starting to run, uh, to, to walk, how many times the child falls? But the child will never give up. The child will never say, oh, I can never do it. No, he gets up and does. And the parents also, the parents, what the parents say, they don't say that, oh, you're every time falling. They're telling, no, no, come on, come on, come on. And then one day he runs, he's able to walk. When he's 25, 30, 40, will he fall? Certainly, he can slip and fall on the snow. He can trip and fall, but he will walk steadily. So in the same way, we also, in the power of the Holy Spirit, we can start walking. That means we can be overcomers. God wants us to, be over, to overcome sin because we all, we have some conscious sins that we know. We keep doing it. And God says, get rid of that. And that is the one which 
only the Holy Spirit can help us. When we get rid of that, then the Lord will show some more. Till the end of our lives, the Lord will be showing. All little by little, he will be showing. That is how we purify ourselves. But it cannot be done in the soul. We have to enter the most holy place. So in, let's go to Hebrews chapter 10. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus. In the Old Testament times, they didn't have confidence. They couldn't go inside. Anybody went inside will be killed. But today we can go straight into the most holy place by a new and living way which Jesus inaugurated for us through the veil that is his flesh. For 33 and a half years, he denied his will. And that's how that flesh tore and he could enter into the most holy place. We also, when we deny our will, we can enter into the most holy place. Okay, we're in Hebrews. I'll show you one more verse, Hebrews 4.12, which for years I could not understand this. I could not understand. And it was always nagging in my mind, what is the meaning of this? Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. For the word of God is living, powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit. Okay? So soul and spirit is very two separate things. And the word of God, now the word that is being preached, it goes, separates soul and spirit, and then what happens? It wants to enter the spirit, but is unable to enter the spirit because there is a door there, the veil, our flesh, our will, our strong will, which doesn't allow it to go inside. And unless the word goes inside through the flesh, only then we can have fellowship with the Lord. So the only way to have fellowship with the Lord in the most holy place is to deny our self-will. Denying our self-will is so important, like Pastor Bob once showed us, seven times in the gospel it is mentioned to deny our self-will. And it's there in the epistles, so it, it, it's a very important thing, because without that, we cannot enter the most holy place. We will be in the, in the soul, and there's the Old Testament. God wants us to come into the New Testament Today we are having the Holy Communion, and in the Holy Communion, Jesus said, this is the new covenant when he gave the, bar, the, the uh, cup. He said, this is the new covenant in my blood. He has opened a new way, this new covenant, for us to enter boldly into the most holy place by denying our will. Whenever we deny our will, a little, whenever we deny, we become like Jesus Christ in nature. Little by little. That's how we purify ourselves. That's how we become more and more Christ-like. If we live like this, denying our will, try to imagine, picture this. For one month, if you live like this, denying your will, I mean, the peace and joy that will come, the kingdom of God, what is the kingdom of God? Romans 14, 17 says, the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Righteousness comes through the Holy Spirit. And when righteousness comes, there will be peace and joy, inner peace and joy. Amidst all our problems, there will be peace and joy. And that is what God wants us to have. He wants us to have the taste of heaven on earth itself. There, there is a verse in Deuteronomy chapter 11 and verse 21. And the King James Version, it says that... Pastor Bob, can you read it? You got a King James Version. 1121. Deuteronomy 1121 says, one second. That the days may be multiplied and the days of your children in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers to give them as the days of heaven upon the earth. As the days of heaven upon the earth. That's what the Lord wants. As the days of heaven upon the earth. The last line. I like that word. It's in King James Version, very clear. As the days of heaven upon the earth. See, our God is such a good God. He wants us to have the, that kind of life. We will have all kinds of problems, but still, it will be heavenly. When unbelievers see that kind of life in us, we don't have to go and tell them, hey, listen, I, I got the good news. They'll come and ask. They'll say, 
what, what is the secret behind your life? How are you able to live like this? And then there we have an opening to preach the good news. So this is to enter the most holy place. God wants us to enter the most holy place. And in the most holy place when, it, when we enter, it is not singing or shouting and all this. It's just silence in the presence of God. In the presence of God, there is fullness of joy. No shouting, no, no, no screaming and all that. And when we have that fellowship and then when we come out, then our service will be wonderful. That's why Jesus said, you shall worship the Lord and serve him. He told the devil when the devil was tempting him. He said, you will worship the Lord and then serve him. So worship comes first in the most holy place. Worship is only possible in the most holy place. In Matthew chapter 7, we read about the wise man. This is the last, with this I'll, I will end. I have shown you many verses. But these are the verses that give me real encouragement because the word of God is really powerful. 7 verse 24, 25. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine, what are these words? If you read Matthew 5, 6, 7, there's the Sermon on the Mount. He's talking about that. If you obey these words, you may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And you know, the rains fell and all that, and the, that house didn't get crumpled. But you see the foolish man, everyone who hears these words of mine and does not obey them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. When you read this Matthew, when I, you, you think that the wise man went to, the, to a rocky soil and he built his house. And the foolish man went to a sandy place and he built his house. No, it's not like that. If you go to Luke chapter 6, there you'll find the real meaning. Luke chapter 6 and verse 47. Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and acts on them, and acts on them, that means obeys them, I will show you whom he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep. You see, here we get the, he dug deep, the wise man dug deep. He, fought, he was digging and it was sandy soil. He kept digging, 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 and then he hit the rock. He didn't stop there. The foolish man stopped there. But the wise man, he blasted the rock, he spent money, he spent time, and then he laid the foundation after digging the rock, and then his house stood. So building a house on the sandy soil is the soul. Everything done in the soul is building your house, spiritual house on the sandy soil. But when you dig deep, when you go through the whale, denying your self-will, and entering into the most holy place, that is building your house on the rock. When we deny ourselves, will the Lord will help us to obey the commandments. It will be a joy. In 1 John, in 1 John chapter 5, John the Apostle, he is now in his 90s. He must be 90 years old, 1995. And he says, the commandments of the Lord are not not cumbersome, they are not difficult. At the age of 90, in the 90s, he's telling that the commandments of the Lord are not difficult. Do you find the commandments difficult? Yes, we find the commandments difficult because we are living in the soul. Once we enter into the spirit, in the spirit life, then things will become easy because the Holy Spirit will work in us. He will, he will give us the desire and the ability to fulfill his word. This is the word of God today. To God be the glory. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, Lord. Whatever I, I have spoken, Lord, it will not be effective unless you give life to it, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that the Holy Spirit will touch each, each one of our hearts so that we can enter into the most holy place and have fellowship with you, Lord, where we can be having righteousness, peace, and joy. 
Help us, Heavenly Father. Without your help, it's impossible, Lord. Those who are wanting this life, give it to them, Lord. And those who are not interested, put the interest in them, Lord. I pray, Lord, that everyone sitting here, Lord, who heard this message will be gripped by it, Lord, through the power of the Holy Spirit. We are living in end times. Very soon you're going to come, Lord. When you come, help us to stand before you with joy. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Today we have the Holy Communion. So please distribute the Holy Communion. <laughs>